Nelson Mandela, a free man, taking his first steps into freedom. There's no question that the fall of the Soviet Union meant a new era. It happened so suddenly, like the Wizard of Oz. You know, you got that and nothing there. I mean, I discovered when I got here that there were two and a half people who had this project. There was a group of people who were building a field and, and pushing the agenda that really felt like they had a mission. It was kind of launched on a hope and a prayer. The LSE did not give a big bankroll, set up development studies. I think we were 20 students, three teaching staff. As I understand it, the economics department at LSE was quite resistant and they said, well, there is no separate development economics. It's, a, it's not another subject, it's just economics. The, the 1990s were, looking back, you know, with, with the benefit of hindsight, were a, an era of innocent hubris. I think the people who founded this department in 1990 were well ahead of their time, and they saw something that the rest of the world has been just catching up to. 30 years ago when we thought about development, we tended to define it in pretty narrow economic terms. Per capita income or the GDP growth rate are very inadequate measures of what development does. And so if you want to do development, you really have to go on into this other aspect, which basically come from sociology, anthropology, geography. A lot of political economy, political science. Really, we can't address development issues without taking environmental issues into account. Without a gender analysis, it implies that you think all these big themes affect men and women in exactly the same way. 30 years ago, if people had talked about there being a double burden of disease, in other words, if you like, diseases of affluence coexisting alongside diseases of poverty in many low and middle income countries, people would have looked really surprised. I don't think anybody would have seen it coming in 1990. The, the, the most dramatic development example in the history of the world. In a country that has grown so fast, so quickly. Somebody was asking me earlier this year if our department does a lot of research on China, and my answer was that everything that, our, everything that we do is one step removed from China. After 1990, we see um, different forms of conflict uh, predominating. So we see um, conflict organized around uh, nationalism or ethnicity. We see uh, much greater links with global economies and uh, the movement, particularly of um, lootable resources. Um, we see civilians increasingly targeted as a direct uh, target of warfare rather than an incidental consequence of war. We said there's not nearly enough attention on what has been a growing space since the, the, the end of the Cold War of conflicts that were really wrenching apart, particularly sub-Saharan Africa, that if there's going to be a future for development, these kind of questions have to be addressed and they're not being addressed. It was manifestly obvious right from the start, as soon as we started offering courses on humanitarian upheavals and conflicts and wars, that students wanted to study that. They felt it was really important. The amount of enthusiasm and take-up for international development courses was such that it was no longer appropriate really to remain designated a, an institute. It's only quite recently that, the, that uh, international development has recognised cities as an important part of the international development discourse. I try and show how, how gendered labour markets are and how they reproduce a disadvantage. Our junior economists have published in the top economic journals doing work that is really relevant to developing countries and will build actionable knowledge to help state capacity improve delivery of all kinds of services that people need, health, education, revenue generation. A lot of the world's, uh, the attention of the world on development is what about sub-Saharan Africa? We're spending a lot of time teaching about that. 
um, it's odd to do that to rooms in which there's nobody from those countries there. The LSE wanted to set up a program for African leadership and the idea is to build up this network of engaged, well-trained Africans who have a commitment to remaining linked to each other and dealing with issues to deal with leadership in Africa. So what we have here is about 40 students from all over the world, There's, they're from every continent, you know, and they are here because they want to, in some sense, become activists when they go home. How do you become an intelligent, thoughtful, effective activist? What are the kind of tools you need? We, we don't look at issues in a disciplinary way, which tends to be inward looking, where problems are attacked, chosen and, and defined in ways that help progress the discipline. We're trying to help progress development, we're trying to help the world progress. It's about engaging in the world and making a difference. Our studies and our findings get worked into politicians' agendas. We've got two Syrians, a Sudanese, um, a South African. France, Germany, Italy, um, Spain. In the classroom we have people from different conflict zones, different areas of expertise, people who have worked for the UN. We have doctors, engineers, nurses anthropology graduates, political science graduates, so there's, there's so much happening. You're really going to take away like the analytical skills and the critical thinking skills. It's really opened my mind up to like a broader spectrum of things out there. There's nothing more noble than working in development. Young people, this is, this is your future and you should work in this area as seriously as you possibly can. You could be a pivotal generation in putting things right.